Well, I, um, I have the privilege of traveling around and talking a lot to groups of anywhere between 50 and, you know, 300 people would be a big event for me because I'm kind of, you know, a B-level player. And I just want to say ahead of time uh, that in front of a group of, of clients, and I've got some family here and, and the, our, our employee team is here as well, this is arguably one of the more nervous times I've been public speaking, which is, which is kind of funny. So the good part about that is, is I'm going to start a presentation about storytelling by telling you guys a few stories. But initially we're going to let Hollywood give a role, and then the question to you is, could you tell the story I'm about to show you the same way? So we're going to start off with a brief two-minute movie trailer. Here we go. See that movie? A couple of folks, right? How uh, could you tell that same story the same way in modern times? Why not? What technology has changed so you could not tell the same story? No guesses? I mean, really, don't you think they'd be laying in bed texting each other at 2 a.m. going, oh, <laughs> Dad's so not cool, man. I know Capulet, right? I mean, that's, that's how it would go down right now. And one of the things, and we, we feel quite a bit of uh, stress in the environment right now, everything from the economy to, you know, politics, nobody can get along. And there's this question of why, why are we feeling this way? And part of it has to do with technology. There is a book called uh, The Great Leap, uh, I'm sorry, in the book Guns, Germs, and, Teal, and Steel, they refer to it as the Great Leap Forward, which is 50,000 years ago when we started to be human beings. We were, uh, you know, prior to that, whatever we were, we didn't actually have it. And starting at that time, I could guarantee you that when you walked around, you had two things on you. You had one, you had something of value. And that something of value might have been seeds, it might have been arrowheads, but it was something of value that you could use to exchange for other items. And the second thing was you would have a method of accessing something of value. We refer to those nowadays as keys, right? So 50,000 years go by, and for the first time ever, what's the third object we all carry? It's a cell phone, right? So we're, we're like, oh, we've got to figure out this iPhone thing, but realize that we're not wired to handle it. So basic storytelling, something as fundamental as Romeo and Juliet, is now thrown out the window. And how many of us groan when we see, like, a fake computer on TV, right? I love those CSI shows. It, like, turns blue and goes, doo, 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 doo. I'm like, what the hell application is that? <laughs> you know, and it, it, it'll make that type of app. And so storytelling has fundamentally been altered by the technology that we're using. And social media is obviously a big part of that. Again, going back to the Shakespeare quote, a curse upon your houses, right? I mean, how many businesses feel that Facebook is literally a curse upon? Actually, anyone from the zoo in here? 
Okay. Can you guys access Facebook at work? Yes. Yes, you can. All right. Can everybody access Facebook at work? No. Okay. All right. So what we're dealing with is for the first time, the, the, as we tell our marketing stories, we reach out. Um, and now that I know they're here, I'm, I'm going to have to delete a few slides, guys. So, but um, no, I won't do that. But 50,000 years, 50,000 years of history has changed. So cut yourself some slack. That's the first thing. Cut yourself some slack. If you're feeling stressed out, you should. You haven't had time to adapt. We haven't had time to evolve. But it does change the way we tell our story. And not just in the movies. What we're going to talk about today as well is how you are going to talk about your business and your brand, both personal and a business brand, and tell your own story online. So we're going to hit the basics. How do we tell a story? We're going to cover uh, some of the elements of a story, such as characters and personas. And then we're going to talk about how to motivate those characters at a very human level. Because unlike the characters in a book that we can script, in social media, we can't. Uh, now, of course, in Matthew Inman's talk earlier today, he said some things were very, very predictable. I had somebody comment to me at lunch that so far the most tweeted thing coming out of ShippleCon, thank you for using the hashtag, was regarding unicorn farts. And I'm pretty sure... <laughs> And for those of you who weren't in this session, the question was, uh, top 10 reasons why it'd be cool to date a unicorn. Now, that is it, it's genius, right? And number one was uh, they, they fart rainbows or glitter. They, yeah, they fart glitter. Um, and that's, we chuckle. Why? We're not even sure. But what he's found is a way to tell a story and to interact with us that, that we're compelled to take the role of that other character. And we're going to retweet it. And we're going to continue to talk about it. I mean, you know, one of the, I, you know, two of the groups in here I would love to tell a story about is, I mean, does anyone else think it's kind of ironic that we've got Tony Sacheries on all the tables at the zoo with all the animals out there? Anyone else want to <laughs> connect the dots, maybe? Um, <laughs> so there, there are ways, and I was going to do that tweet, and I thought, no, that's not a story that I should tell at this conference. <laughs> but it would have been retweeted, right? Right? Um, all right, so we're going to talk about motivating the characters. For the business folks in here, this is a phenomenal book called Primal Branding. And what Primal Branding talks about is every strong brand has these seven elements. It has a creation story. We know the story of Zuckerberg writing Facebook and going off. We know the story of Jeff Bezos from Amazon who jumped in his car and went west and his wife was in the back seat writing the business plan. And, and these are just creation stories. They don't, they're partially based in fact, but they're also, also you know, polished a little bit by the, by the PR people, right? They have a creed, they have icons, they have rituals, um, they have pagans, they have to have non-believers. Let me repeat that. Primal brands have to have non-believers. So those people who dislike you give you legitimacy and actually strengthen your brand when you're telling a story. So we talk about trolls. Well, trolls you pretty much just write off, but the people who are actually out there hating on your brand legitimately, but they're kind of walking the line of reasonableness, they're part of your overall brand story and they actually strengthen it. And then the last one is you have to have a leader, which is one of those, it can be a figurehead leader or, I mean, it can be Toby. Uh, I'm sorry, Toby, for those of you who don't know, is the world's cutest animal and it's, it's uh, in danger of being kidnapped by my employees. Um, I understand, I was told, uh, and it's within a couple hundred yards of us. So. so Toby can be the leader, but it has to do it. It's a great book. So going back to classic storytelling, it's told in a narrative form. Uh, everything that we do, and if you break down the, the talk that I've been giving so far, it's all these little anecdotes and these little, these little stories. So how do we bring that online? How do we go and we do modern storytelling through social media? And as I mentioned earlier, we, for the first time, we can't control our other actors, right? We can compel them to take action by, by having very innovative and attractive content that they're drawn to it, but we actually have no method of doing it. Um, I retweeted somebody the other day, uh, and... I, how many of you guys are on Twitter? Okay, because I was in Deirdre's talk, a couple uh, lingo things. For those of you not on Twitter, you, you do a tweet, 140 characters, uh, and then when somebody retweets you, they literally type RT, and then your name, and then what you said. Uh, so that's called retweeting. And it tend, it, it's basically like a viral method of spreading a message. So elements of storytelling. You've got four basic items that you're using when you tell a story. First, you've got your primary message. The second, you have to have a conflict. So we all know the story, uh, you know, every customer is satisfied, right? Well, it's kind of boring, isn't it? I mean, your most passionate customers are the people who, uh, who you've messed up on, and then they've gone back and they've fixed it. Characters, and again, we go back to, you've got all the different people from the primal brand, the good and the bad, the believers and the pagans. 
And then lastly, you've got the plot. And of course, in social media, what we effectively have is a never-ending story. It's just progressing forward. We hope it's progressing forward, right? And you're going to pass it on. So let's talk about the message. The message is your strategic premise. So we all recognize just do it, right? And for those of you in the crowd, by the way, uh, a little bit of Nike advertising history. Nike didn't advertise for, I think, 20 years. They just did sponsorships. Uh, and does anybody know the first product Nike went after, first market? It was, it was the 1970s, and it turns out, who knew, but um, chicks like to work out too. Um, and so nobody had really gone after the female athletic shoe market, and they owned that niche. That was their... That was what they were, and then from there they expanded. So being on the, on the advertising marketing side, it pains me when people say, I'm going to advertise like Nike, and I'm like, great. If you're Apple or Nike, you can advertise like Nike. But the rest of us, <laughs> we have to tell a story that's a lot more narrow so that people can understand it. What is the real statement of your brand, and what is the story you're trying to tell? And you've got to stick to those one or two messages. One of the most boring jobs in the world would be to be a brand manager for Tide Detergent, because if you're good, that message is not going to change. And what happens is after 10 years, you get really tired of calling Coke the real thing, and you change it because you're bored, but the audience hasn't given as much attention. So for them, you've got to stay on message. And different audiences mean different messages. So as a speaker, I ask those questions, who's on Twitter? And the vast majority of you guys are, so that allows me to say some things I would say differently. Same thing in, in social media. I was talking to uh, the guys from Imagine Motive, and I was asking them what he was doing with social media, and he said, you know, a lot of our guys who do tailgating are, you know, six-year-old retirees, and they're not on Twitter, Ed, so you can't necessarily do outreach. You've got to come up with a different message for a different audience. What are your vision, mission, and values? There's really two camps of business people, right? Those who believe in vision, mission, and values, and those who say it's a bunch of bunk. Um, I'll say right out, I'm definitely in the, if you have an articulated vision and mission, uh, and you state your values. In fact, our, our employees literally have cards. And our vision, to share it with you, is to connect and organize the world's people and do good. And it's funny, because you, you drift away. I've drifted away several times. And somebody will say, well, uh, or, and they use it against me, too. They're like, we should sponsor this. I'm like, oh, that's expensive. And they're like, well, it's good, right? You know? Um, but having that vision and mission, it lets you look at a Twitter or a tweet that somebody has done and figure out if that's part of your overall brand story. And tomorrow I'm talking on personal brands. We'll talk about that natural conflict between the two. So vision, mission, and values. Promoting your message, um, number one, like in the example of Nike, is just do it. And they've got the run faster blog. So that it's not a just do it blog. It's a run faster. And again, we saw with Southwest Airlines, theirs was just nuts, right? So they're coming up with good, kitschy advertising phrases, but they're on message with the other items. And this is the, the legwork you simply have to do, in my opinion, to properly tell your story online. Um, we Innovate, We Help talks about Nike's R&D. Conflict. Conflict doesn't always have to be negative. There can just be adversity that's out there. Um, that conflict, I, I wrote a story recently for the Chronicle, and what we were talking about was after Hurricane Ike, the strangest thing happened in my neighborhood. A couple guys with chainsaws formed a little gang, and they would start sawing down trees. And then another gang of guys came up behind and they would start stacking uh, the wood that the guys with the chainsaws had done. So the chainsaw gang then just got very efficient. These four guys went house to house to house to house and just chainsawed everything up and everyone else went behind them. And it was, it was literally a roving chainsaw gang, but no money changed hands. So I was telling a friend about this after Hurricane Ike and one of the things he said was, we had those in my neighborhood too, Ed. It's just they charged $250 a house. Now, right? And so at this point, you know, if you're me, what are you thinking? I'm, I'm back there. I'm like, man, my neighborhood rocks, dude. You got screwed. Where do you live? Um, and, and, it, and then in the, in the Chronicle Post, they went on and they started talking about the different types of personalities. And then in the bizarre twist of fate, they started talking about race and, and allocating, well, the Mormons were really good at this. And, and you're just like, wow, where did that come from? But that's an example of telling a story in social media where the conflict was very real between the two different types of neighborhoods. And then they went and they tried to start solving that problem for us by assigning racial quotas to which neighborhood was more likely, which clearly was not my intent, right? But it's a, another example of storytelling and social media. Does anybody know the name of the CEO of this company? Oh, come on, somebody knows it. Mackie. Mackie? Why do you know it? Okay. <laughs> Uh, 
He's in the news quite a bit, okay? And by the way, for those of you students of body language, this is what he's in the news for, yeah. <laughs> um, Mac, and he recently came out with a solution to our health care, by the way. So he's, he's reaching out in all these different ways. And again, that's a conflict between, you know, the Mackey brand, the Raho Deb brand, and the Whole Foods brand. But it's an example, again, remember our, our seven elements of a primal uh, brand? You can't separate the leader, can you? So he's the leader of the brand, therefore is reflecting the rest of it. Now, the whole story, on the other hand, does a phenomenal job and is very much on-brand message. Again, I don't have a solution here. I'm just pointing out when you're storytelling online through social media that you do have these natural conflicts. All right, my Starbucks. What my Starbucks did is they've actually got a couple of interesting uh, stories. One, there was a, uh, there's a Starbucks gossip site, and they couldn't figure out where the guy was getting all the information and they found out that he actually worked in the same building they did, and he was just listening to information in the elevator, <laughs> right? Yeah, pretty clever, huh? Um, what he wound up actually doing was that they adopted it and embraced it, and they continue to uh, receive information and, and requests. Again, for those of you in the Southwest Airlines, I, th I think it's very, very similar to the example she gave on the seating. All right, characters. Who are the main players and who are uh, the multipurpose characters, the, the role players? There's a book called The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. And Gladwell talks about it takes three different types of people to tip something over. It takes connectors, it takes mavens, and it takes salespeople. <coughs> I'll give you an example of a, a connector is somebody, um, she's, she's the woman who grew up and then uh, went and got a job and she was a lawyer and then she went home and raised her kids and then she went back into the workforce as an executive director and then teaches part-time as an adjunct professor at Rice. And by the way, she also knits. This is a woman who can connect you with anyone from the biggest lawyers in town to the PTA uh, to the people in the craft community, right? And you can't identify her. So that's a connector. We all know those connectors. Actually, somebody throw out a few connectors on Twitter in Houston. Cosmopolitan is one. Who else? JR. JR. JR Cohen, at JR Cohen on Twitter. Maslow Beer. Anybody else? All right. For the folks who aren't on Twitter, did you know any of those names before? All right, my point here is I'm identifying those characters. It's a critical element because they're not as transparent. In public relations, we previously have something called a Bacon's directory where I can buy it and it'll list everybody who is a reporter. And I no longer have access to that because the connectors, the mavens, and the salespeople are now living in social media. And the only way you can know is by being involved in the community. That's not a bad thing because we would rather have we would rather have the people in the community telling the story than an outside PR agency out of New York coming in trying to start trouble in Houston, right? But, not that we would ever do that. Hello, I'm a Mac. Hold up. Here I come. Whoa, PC? Yeah. It's all this trial software. They pack my hard drive full of it, all these programs that don't do very much unless you buy the whole thing or are just plain useless. Uh, really slows me down. <sighs> you know how it is. Oh, actually, I don't. Max, just come with the stuff you want, like iTunes, iMovie, iPhoto, iWeb. It's all part of iLife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you Let's ready? just do this, okay? Okay. Hello, I'm I, Max. I, I forgot something. I love those ads because they don't even show the product, do they? I mean, it's absolutely preposterous. But they tell the whole thing very beautifully, very minimal words, simply through character development. And they have used character development in this advertisement over time, haven't they? I mean, it's, it's, you feel for the guy, right? You almost feel sorry for the PC guy. Like, you want to, oh, let me help, right? You know, I mean, we want to reach out to them. All right, so the Apple story has uh, the same story elements. We've got our, our benefactor. We have an overall goal. Um, we have our beneficiary, which, of course, in this case is the Mac. We have the adversary, which we all understand to be Microsoft, right? Mm -hmm. IBM to a lesser extent. But we know that the bad guy is Microsoft. But they never get mentioned, do they? They always say PC, so they really, it's ingenious that they can't defend themselves. Um, they have a hero, which is Jobs. And again, there's your leader. One of the catches with Jobs, remember he was out sick with, uh, he was out sick for what, six months? And the stock went down because they have so much faith in their leader uh, that it actually is hurting the Apple story. And then you have support. They're well known for support. Uh, April Kyle on my team came into my office the other day and she goes, man, I got great support from Apple. I went in the other day, my iPhone was, was broken and they, and they replaced it for me. And I was like, wow, that's great. She's like, yeah, I mean, I just, you know, I really believe in Apple care. And I said, you know, how long have you had an iPhone? She said, oh, a little bit over a year. And I said, which, which phone is this? She said, number three. I said, how is it that this company's given you a product that's crapped out on you two out of three times? 
And you're in here bragging to me that you paid extra to get customer service. And you're happy about it. <laughs> That's a phenomenal story, isn't it? It's an absolutely phenomenal story. And for the record, my BlackBerry still works. So. <laughs> All right. So how do you speak to the different personas? And the reason I'm mentioning this is because you cannot use the same voice. Now, that becomes a problem. Uh, another friend, uh, Mandy, when she, she's in charge of an organization called Fresh Arts, she signed up on Twitter as Fresh Arts, or Fresh Arts H-O-U. And, and I was talking to her, and I'm like, I'm not sure that's a good strategy, because what happens when you leave? She's like, well, I'm not going to leave. And I said, well, I understand, but, but what if you did? And she was like, well, no, that's OK. But we also talked about how does, how does it change your behavior when you're tweeting underneath one name versus the other name? Are you guys going to tweet the same thing between those? Because I'm sure as hell not, right? Uh, in fact, I have submitted one blog post for blog.shipple.com, one. Uh, it got rejected as not being on message from my lovely communications team. Uh, and, and so that's an example of, you know, but, and they literally go, we recommend you post this on eshipple.com. And I'm like, you know, I'm, why? Because they felt it was off-brand message. So it actually changes our very own behavior. Now, that's frustrating because now you're paying an employee who's sitting there tweeting at work under their personal account versus the work account, right? And, and again, we'll hit more on that tomorrow, but that's really what you have to do. You have to have your own persona and speak in your own voice because it changes the way you're speaking. If I'm twittering under the company one, I'm talking to one audience that expects this level of professionalism and uptime and you know, security and all those things. If it's 2 a.m. and I'm tweeting under eShipple, well, well they, they know I'm a little neurotic already. This isn't a news flash to them if they're reading a tweet from me at 2 a.m., right? What kind of character are you? And again, this kind of goes back to Gladwell, but it's slightly different. And you've got the caregivers, and, and there's, uh, there's some wonderful tweets, like the 12 most annoying people you'll meet on Twitter. Um, I, my favorite is the, the one that's like, someday soon, big changes. Right? I mean, we know that person. Tomorrow is another day. You know, and you, you know, I'm like, not if I can help it, and I have a, you know, anyway. <laughs> I mean, um, or the people at the TMI. I mean, we had a recent uh, situation that, that came up. If you look up Penelope Trunk in the news, you can see that she tweeted some things which are clearly too much information for folks. So you want to be careful uh, what role you're playing, what character you're in, and which audience you're speaking to. All right, so weaving your audience into the story. Uh, this product up here called Poll Everywhere, it's a great product. Oh, actually, a couple of technical tips. Uh, one, download multiple browsers when you're Twittering. When you're, when you're storytelling online, per se. And the reason you do that is because Firefox, for me, is all my personal accounts. Internet Explorer, on my other monitor, is all my work accounts. So I can easily switch back and forth without having to, to redo everything. Does that make sense? Now, Poll Everywhere, this is a tool that you can use, and you just create a poll, and people with their cell phones can do and text in a vote. And I think you can do up to 30 votes. It's free. We actually have used it in meetings to, uh, to vote on layout design, although you know, whether designed by committee is a good idea or voting is a, is a separate issue, but it's a great tool. Also, you've got uh, chip in, poll daddy, and intense debate. And what you're doing, again, like Southwest Airlines spoke about, is getting their opinion and their involvement in it so that they have a basis for it that you can take on. Listening. Um, I, I like to say to people that I could get a public speaking gig anywhere as long as I propose the topic, measuring the ROI of social media, right? I mean, it's, it's, it, no, it's true because, I mean, that, everyone wants that. Everyone wants that. Here's the thing, though. It's like, it's the holy grail. You will never, ever, ever get there. It's like measuring the ROI of branding. You can't prove it. You can't prove it. I mean, if you actually wanted to do it, what you'd have to do is do a comprehensive survey, run your campaign, do the survey again. Uh, if there are any clients in the room willing to pay for that level of survey, please come talk to me after, but I've yet to meet them. So when you're, when you're, Measuring the ROI, make sure that you're measuring the right things. In other words, if you're getting traffic, that's great, but it's got to actually produce some form of business results or some form of attention. And part of that is mastering the art of listening. Google Analytics is the most basic one. You should all be running that. I think we hit a couple other tools. Uh, for the PR wonks in the house, the two big ones are Vocus, V-O-C-U-S, and then Radian 6. I want to say Vocus is like 500, and Radian 6 is like something obscene, like 5,000 and up. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because you're going to know more about that than I do, yeah. So, yeah, those are your basic ones, but there are a lot of free tools. But just as when you go to a cocktail party, you're going to go in, you're going to listen and kind of get the vibe of the room before you go on and you start screaming. All right, I need a, I need a volunteer. I just want to ask you a few questions. You want to volunteer? 
All right, it's Tom, right? All right, Tom. Here's here's what I want you to do. I'm going to I'm going to offer to give you a thousand dollars, and I'll really I'll front the grand. And what I want you to do is I want you to get in a small rubber dinghy with an outboard motor, and I want you to take it up the coast, and I want you to go up to the Arctic, and then where the whales are, they've got these Russian ships that hunt them, and they shoot these harpoons, and I want you and your rubber dinghy to go in between those to save the whales. <laughs> Will you do that for me? The price isn't enough. The pr okay, all right. The price is not enough, so we, we're not discounting whales entirely. So would you do that for, say, $10,000? Would you put your body in between a harpoon and a Russian whaling ship for $10,000? I would do it for $1 million. You'd do it for $1 million. <laughs> <laughs> so Tom, would it be fair to say that you hate whales? <laughs> so, it's the ROI. It's the, the ROI of saving whales, please. Uh, hashtag Shipple Khan. Uh, <laughs> All right, so Tom, how much do you think this guy's getting paid? Nothing. So Tom's hating on the whales, won't do it for a million, and you're saying this guy's doing it for free? We probably didn't vote for the same president. Okay. <laughs> Twenty-seven minutes in, and we've gone to politics. Sweet. <laughs> All right. So, really, what the hell's wrong with these people? Why? Why are they doing that? Why? Are they, actually, there are zoo people here. You probably, you know, channel the same types. What? What's going on, man? There, He's ideologically motivated, isn't it? I mean, this is this is somebody who passionately feels about the whales, unlike Tom. Um, so I did a bunch of reading on the motivations of different people, and it really boils down to three things, and only three things, material, social, and ideological. Now, material motivation is the most straightforward, right? I'm going to give you $3, you're going to give me a cup of coffee and a comfy chair to sit in for 30 minutes. Uh, material is arguably the most ethical method of motivating somebody. However, if somebody says, hey, I'll give you 10 bucks to write a nice blog post about me, eh, see, we've crossed the line there, haven't we? Well, for most people, we've crossed the line. So material is very straightforward. Social, well, this is the one that came on hugely. And one of the miracles of the internet that you'd never used to do before, do you realize for the first time it's easy to find these nutcases? <laughs> right? See, before we had to like meet at a tree in the redwoods once a year or something. But now I can Google and I can find anyone who believes in anything. Uh, my sister does these weird cakes, like chocolate little angels and stuff like that, and she lives in Savannah, Georgia. It's not a very big town. There's not a critical mass of people that do mm, that with chocolate in Savannah. But on the internet, she can easily find them. So just to repeat that, one of your big aha moments today is you can easily find the ideologically motivated people, which are the folks who are going to be able to carry your story. Because you're not, you're not trying to convince them to tell a new story. You're just finding the people who are ideologically aligned with what your mission is, and you're being absolutely truthful and transparent. Now, the social is the one that we most often think of, obviously, when we think about Facebook and Twitter and friending, et cetera. Um, I read a stat recently that said two-thirds of all page views on Facebook were uh, of guys viewing women's profiles. Um, and it was that way on most of the social networks that the women's site, the women's pages had uh, two-thirds as many views, and with the exception of that being Twitter. And the researchers theorized that maybe it was because men were more willing to represent themselves in words, or they are actually don't sure. They couldn't actually say why. So these are elements that we don't like to talk about. Well, it's not that we don't like to talk about them, it's just uncomfortable, right? We live in a society where, you know, if you, if you mention race or gender, but that, that's part of storytelling. If I start telling you a story about, you know, a, a young boy and a young girl, and I don't tell you what country they're in, your brain is, is distracted trying to assign those things. Now, what that means in storytelling is, use, like on Facebook, please, upload a profile picture, because it's going to culturally change things and the way people interact with you. And, and usually in a good way, because they're going to interact with you the way you want to be interacted with. That's a deep topic for a glass of wine sometime. <laughs> All right, the plot. The plot is really the difference between the king died and then the queen died. And the king died by the sword and the queen died of grief. Those are very, very different stories, aren't they? Um, and so a lot of that also has to do with, with how you are articulating your thoughts. And if you make things more interesting to people, again, you're going to command more of their attention. Stories progress, you establish, you interact, connect, and you play. They usually have a climax. 
So this conference has been the center of our world for quite some time now. So this is kind of a climax. I'm, I'm, I promise you, I'm not going to work on Saturday. I'm going to, I'm going to take, <laughs> take a break from that, right? So it builds up, but I probably will go to work on Monday because I'm going to meet a lot of new friends. And what happens then? If I connect with you guys on Facebook or on Twitter, I want to keep that relationship going because otherwise, when the next story comes, I, I won't be able to retell your story for you and vice versa. And again, that's that law of reciprocation. But we do have this series of falling actions and onward. I was talking to one of uh, the people on our team named Faiza, and I was saying, you know, well, what do you think is next? One of the things Faiza said was, you know, I, I think we all need a break. I think everyone's going to dial it back just a little bit on the social networks because the last year we've been so caught up in it. Now, if Faiza's right or not, I'm, I'm not sure, but I know personally I've kind of dialed it back just because there's this, there's this wave or this biorhythm type thing that, that I see out there. For your plot, video, 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 video. We talked about the motivations of people, and we, and I, you know, and, and Tom was self-confident enough, let me joke around with him, but then I showed you that video, right? Or I showed you that picture that really clearly demonstrated what the guy was doing. I opened with a video because it just, it, you know, Shakespeare, you really can't beat it, right? But it really creates it in a way that if I read from it, it wouldn't be the same. I always used to tell people, go out and buy these flip cameras. Um, for the first time, I'm going to say something different. The new iPod Nano uh, records video. It's like $148, and it's much, much smaller uh, than the flip cameras. So one of the things that we do is, you know, putting on our business hat here, if you want to help people uh, tell their story, make it easy for them to do it. As a businessman, I can tell you what I did was, I said, who wants public speaking training? So we train, you know, 20 people, and then of those, you know, 15 are pretty good, and of those, 10 say they want to do it, and of those... Uh, five get asked to come back, and, and, and so you train 20, but then you wind up with five public speaking people that I can easily uh, fit into an arrangement that I may not be able to commit to, right? So same thing with video. Put the cameras in your people's hands. Video and photos are where it's at. So I don't want to downplay some of the logistical aspects of this. For our company, the solution was we cashed in our American Express points. We got a couple of Canon Digital Rebels, and we let any employee check them out for any reason. They're going to drop them, you're going to lose lenses, you're going to lose that stuff, but what are they doing? They're going to, they're going to learn how to use it, and then when it comes time to, to tell the company story, I have no idea why Aaron and the, the fuzzy guy from the Dynamo were running through the yard. <laughs> I, I was not involved in that in any way. Um, but it's already on YouTube. They've literally already posted on YouTube. I'll, I'll show you that in a second, for those of you who missed the, the wonder of it. <laughs> Alright, so that's the power of video. We'll actually close with that. So, Alright. A couple of uh, tips and tricks for storytelling on Twitter. My rule of thumb is four out of five things should not be about you. Uh, we actually went through and did a Myers-Briggs of all of our personality types. So for those of you wondering what, what it takes to be a little bit loopy like me up here, I, I think I'm an INTP. So I'm actually an introvert. I, I'm fine public speaking. It just takes a lot of energy. And then I want to go uh, hide in the corner in a fetal position and have a glass of wine. Um, <coughs> so it's actually more natural for me to talk about you. It's more natural for me to go, oh, look, look what these guys are doing. Oh, hey, check this out, or, or retweet something. Because, so I, I function as a, a filter, and for whatever reason, a lot of people are interested in the things that I think are interesting as well. And since I consume a lot of information, it's, it's gotten me quite a few followers. So definitely tell other people's stories. Uh, link like it's going out of style. Now, on this slide, again, I've got tiny URL, but the one I'm actually hooked on right now is bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y. It will shorten your URLs. But if you log in, it will shorten and tell you how many click-throughs. So like if I tweet something from CNN, I'll say, you sent 92 people to CNN out of 700. Do you follow? So it shows you the ratio. Those are other people. In other words, it's giving you a different bit.ly URL for each individual who posts it. Very clever. If, if I lost you on that, don't worry about it. Ask questions and answer questions. Um, Giovanni uh, Gallucci out of Dallas always talks about that. You know, don't, don't go on for one hour a day. Go on for 15 minutes three times a day. And go on, help people out, answer basic questions, because it comes back to you in spades. You just don't know when and where and how. Um, our company's 12 years old. I, there's no way you could mind map how we got from point A to point B. There are simply too many characters, too many roles, too many stories that have been involved. And you, know, you get to a certain point, and you're like, wow, those are amazing blessings. Because you just don't understand it. I mean, you, and you can't. And just accept that. Just accept it. Definitely share brain candy. And another one is say thank you. It always kills me when I run into people. They think thank you is like a gold coin. Well, if I said thank you yesterday, I'm out. Damn. You know, I mean, 
When was the last time somebody came up and said, hey, 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 you already said thank you. You back off, all right? <laughs> right? I mean, that's not going to happen, all right? Dial it down, I-5 man. All right? <laughs> All right, so definitely follow uh, the buzz. We talked earlier about measurement and metrics, and, and I'm not going to do justice to these because I think we've got a lot of folks who are here. But again, Bitly's the one I'm really hooked on right now. Uh, TwitScoop is another one. CrowdEye, another one that I've been fond of lately. There's a website called Collecta, C-O-L-L-E-C-T-A. It's like search Twitter. Uh, uh, in search, what's happening is search has always been give you the most relevant, right? And then what did search Twitter do? It used to be surmise. It says give me the most recent. So now there's this battle between what's the most relevant, what's the most recent, and is there a hybrid? Personally, I don't think there's a hybrid. I think those companies are wrong. I think our brain is looking for both things uniquely. What Collecta does is it shows you the most recent content, like Twitter searches, but it'll also blend in blogs and YouTube and those type things. Does that make sense? It's actually by the same guy who started Samize. All right, so let's review. I'm going to open up for a few questions. So first, tell your story with the modern tools. Some of the stuff hasn't changed, right? We need characters, we need plot, we need conflict, we need development, we need, to, we need to round things out. That has not changed. The tools have changed. We talked about cell phones, how we're now as human beings trying to interact with devices that, you know, just historically, sociologically, psychologically, anthropology, we're not, we're not familiar with. So we're, we're struggling with it. Oh, actually, i got to call this one out. Who here thinks it's rude to check your text at the dinner table? Who here checks their text at the dinner table when they go out to eat? Okay, so why do you people hate each other? <laughs> why? I mean, do you, do you, have you thought about that one? And it's, it's, it's what? I take my message, I don't hate. You don't, oh, you don't hate. Okay, so, oh, so the, the people who check, you're the pacifists. Uh, <laughs> all right, so there are these, that's a cultural problem, isn't it? That's a, that's a cultural problem that we're working through right now. But if you go out to dinner with a bunch of young people, there's like this unspoken vibe that goes through the room. I mean, I, I swear to God, they're passing a note under the table. All right, text break, text break, text break. You know, and all of a sudden, they all just go silent like this. <laughs> and then, like, they start popping up like prairie dogs. I'm back, I'm back. I'm, you know, and they continue on. <laughs> so, you know, this is, we've, we've not had to deal with this before. And, and we're in these two camps in the division, which is creating this tension. So, like I said, the, the solution here, by the way, ease up on yourselves, man. Ease up a little bit, because this is new stuff. Um, know yourself and know your audience. You definitely have to know your audience. And for me, uh, sometimes I take real explicit communication. So I ask you a question. Who's on Twitter, right? I mean, I just, I, I ask those questions. But usually what I'll do is I'll lurk and I'll listen first. I lurked on Twitter a long time before I jumped in. And then I was at South by Southwest, and I had to get on because... That was the only way I was going to be able to get a beer that night. And then, you know, and, and Twitter's weird. They're like, where are you going? The library. I'm like, really? Um, anyone from Austin knows uh, that's a bar. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. And definitely keep the story going. Uh, I, I like Twitter and Facebook, and there are ways that you can continue to tell your story, but they're very different. They're very different animals. So, uh, and with that, I will teach you one more lesson that I learned uh, while public speaking. And that is, if anyone in the audience ever gives you a pink feather boa, do not let somebody put it on Flickr or you will never live that shit. 